When a person wrongs you, because people will wrong you in life, when a person degrades you, when a person insults you, responding to conflict with more conflict is only going to create strife. But I've not called you to create strife. I've called you to be a peacemaker. Well, how do I be a peacemaker? Well, instead of responding to people in kind, I'll do to them what they did to me. No, no, no. Instead of doing that, meet their indignity by treating them with dignity. Meet their greed by treating them with generosity. Meet their unfair demands with a willingness to do more than is asked because as followers of Jesus, our basic disposition, it is not strife, our basic disposition with other people is peace because peace is exactly what Jesus has achieved for us with God through the cross. We are today uh, finishing a series we've been doing over the last few weeks, and we need to finish it because I'm getting too convicted preparing it, because this series we've been doing in the life of our church over the last few Sundays has been both challenging, confronting, encouraging, and all of the above. Uh, We've been focusing on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and uh, we we need to recognize that uh, Jesus was not just a saviour. Though, thank God, he is a saviour. Anyone in church today, you're grateful that Jesus saved you from your sin? Look at that, 17 people. And we'll do an altar call at the end of the service. Thank God, he's a saviour. Who knows, Jesus was a miracle worker. Thank God, he was and is a miracle worker. That's why we pray to to Jesus and believe for miracles today. Uh, But Jesus was more than just a saviour and more than just a miracle worker. Jesus was also a teacher and a preacher, which means Jesus gives us wisdom to build our lives. Because as many people come to church on Sunday, need a miracle, need God to save them, but then don't know how to put their life together Monday to Saturday, thank God for the whole counsel of God that is able to save us from our sin, heal our hearts and minds and bodies, and give us wisdom so that we can flourish in life. And so the Sermon on the Mount is one of Jesus' most famous sermons. And uh, if we want to understand the man and the message of Jesus, we simply can't bypass the Sermon on the Mount. And so we're going to read an excerpt from it in just a moment. But to make sense of it, if you've uh, missed church the last few weeks, just to give you a little bit of context, to make sense of what we're about to read, we have to set it in light of the history of the nation of Israel. So about 1,500 years before Jesus walked the planet, the nation or the family of Israel were slaves in Egypt. They were liberated from slavery after 400 years, and uh, they're now a free people, free at last. The problem is they don't have a constitution, they don't have a legal code, they don't have a, a, a set kind of moral law. And so what God does is he leads their leader, Moses, up to the top of Mount Sinai. He gives him the Ten Commandments. And Moses from Sinai gives the people of Israel what they would call a Torah, literally means a guide, a way of living. Uh, But Moses himself recognized that he was not the full and the final counsel of God. Moses recognized that there would come one after him who would be a prophet like Moses, and he is the one that we should listen to. 1,500 years later, Jesus walks onto the scene, and in Matthew's gospel, we see in Matthew 5 verse 1 that Jesus, seeing the crowds, went up on the mountain. That's like a prompt in our mind to think back to Moses. And when Jesus sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. And so the Bible is presenting to us Jesus as something of a new Moses, who from a mountaintop is going to give us a new Torah, a new way to live. He's not going to give us the old way. He's going to give us the Jesus way. And I just think that our lives go best when we live the Jesus way. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. Anyone here ever been convinced that you had a good idea and it didn't work out? Happens over and over and over, and that's why we need to yield our way of living to the Jesus way. And so in this teaching block on the Sermon on the Mount, six times over, Jesus said a variation of the line, you have heard that it was said referencing the old law of Moses. And then Jesus followed that by saying, but I say to you. Now, Jesus is not correcting or contradicting Moses. Rather, what Jesus is doing is he is revealing the value that is at the heart of each command. Because better than coming to church and getting a whole bunch of rules, and this is what you should do, and this is what you shouldn't do, is to learn the values of the kingdom of God. Better than just learning the commands of God is to learn the character of God. Because every command that God gives 
flows out of his character. And so if you and I can know what God is like, it can help us to then have the wisdom to figure out what we should be like in our lives as well. And so what Jesus does is he wants to bring us to the values at the heart of every command. So he peels back the layer of the external command and he shows us the value or the principle that undergirds the command. So for example, Jesus says, hey, don't murder. That's good. I agree with Moses. Murdering is bad. Don't murder, but but more than that, don't let your heart be possessed by anger. Jesus says, don't commit adultery, but but more than that, the heart is the issue. In your heart, don't objectify people as just being objects for your use and for your pleasure. Jesus says, hey, don't make oaths, but more than that, don't use your words to manipulate and mislead people so you can bulldoze people and get your own way. Jesus is telling all of us loud and clear, I'm not just interested in your actions, I'm interested in your attitude. I didn't come just to conform your behavior into a religious mold, I came to transform your heart. C.S. Lewis said it this way, we may think God wants actions of a certain kind, but God actually wants people of a certain sort. Why? It's because if God can get our heart right, who knows, our behavior will start to take care of itself. If you get the fountainhead clean, everything that flows from the fountainhead will be clean. If you can plant the right tree, then you will get the right fruit. A lot of times people come to church and the pastor tries to address the fruit of someone's life, but what Jesus wants wants to do is address the tree. He wants to plant a new tree in our heart so that we start to bear new fruit and live a brand new life. That's why Jesus sums up this teaching block by saying, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Don't despair. Perfect doesn't mean never made a mistake. Perfect means whole, means complete, means lacking nothing. And here's what I've learned. If our hearts can get whole, then our lifestyle will start to become holy. If we can start to get our hearts in a right place with God and with our brothers, then the way that we live will naturally fulfill the intent of the command and will live lives of wisdom that honor God and build our lives. Can you say amen today? And so this has been a really light series. So far, we've talked about anger, sex, divorce, marriage, and manipulation. It's been really light. And it gets better. All right, let's keep going. Matthew 5, verse 38. I warned you a few weeks ago not to come back. Matthew 5, 38, in Cairns, pay attention, says this, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. All right, why don't you turn to your neighbor? I'm joking. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, at face value, maybe you're not familiar with the Bible, and at face value, you're pretty horrified about some of what Jesus just said because it raises some legitimate questions. Uh, Is Jesus saying that we should just allow others to beat us up? Does Jesus want us to be doormats? Is Jesus endorsing passivism? Is Jesus telling battered wives and abused children that the right thing to do is remain in a violent situation? Uh, Am I not allowed to say no when people want to borrow my stuff? Uh, What kind of madness is this that Jesus is teaching? And so I think one of the most helpful things we can do is to clarify what Jesus is not saying, so then we can start to clarify what Jesus is saying. So here's three things Jesus is not saying. They'll be on the screen, and we might put that QR code up again in a moment. Firstly, Jesus is not saying that we should just stand around and take abuse. Uh, He's not prohibiting self-defense, and he's not prohibiting us removing ourselves from harmful situations. In fact, in a few minutes' time, we're going to see that this teaching is actually about how we respond to insult, not about how we respond to assault. Second thing he's not saying is this. Jesus is not saying we should think ourselves inferior to other people. You'd be mistaken if you think Jesus' point is that you can allow anyone to treat you like dirt and you must be okay with it. That's not the idea. In fact, it's the opposite. Rather than undermining every individual's value, Jesus in this teaching is actually upholding every individual's value. We'll see that in a moment. Thirdly, Jesus is not saying that governments should adopt passivism. 
I've heard some people say, well, you know, Christian nations should never go to war and they base it on this. But Jesus is speaking to individuals about interpersonal conflict. He's not speaking to governments about international conflict. Elsewhere, the Bible is really clear that governments have a responsibility to restrain evil and to punish wrongdoers. And so who knows how a government responds to acts of war or terrorism or crime is very different to how you and I respond to somebody insulting us. That's a very different topic. So what exactly is Jesus talking about? Now we've cleared away some of the fog. What's Jesus talking about? He's actually speaking about retaliation. Retaliation. It's that inbuilt tendency toward us, toward wanting revenge and wanting payback. Who knows, your mum and dad never had to sit you down as a kid and teach you how to have a revengeful spirit. Who knows that comes baked in? It's wired within us. We don't need to go to school to learn how to retaliate. There is this sense within the human heart where we all want to get back at people who we deem to have wronged us or harmed us. And so to make sense of what Jesus is saying about slaps, tunics, and extra miles, we have to put it in light of the setting. In verse 38, Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, what Jesus is doing here is he is quoting Old Testament Jewish law found in Deuteronomy chapter 19, where it says, it shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, and foot for foot. Now, whilst that command sounds really brutal, the command itself was not given with brutal intent. In fact, the command was given with the intent of actually curbing retaliation and limiting the escalation of violence. Because has anyone noticed today, maybe in Moresby, Emerald, uh, or East London, have you noticed that conflict, retaliation, has a way of escalating? Have you noticed that? I know that because I've got siblings. I've got an older brother, about two years older than me, and as kids, we used to play football on the back lawn, and of course, there was no umpires, we umpired it ourselves, and uh, if my brother hit me, or if I deemed him to have hit me, then I was going to, some of you are like, did you pray for him, you're a pastor? No, I was going to hit him back. Of course, I was going to hit him back, but, but how many brothers he would say, when you hit your brother back, you always add a little bit of interest to it, don't you? It's never proportionate. You always add it. Why? Because your emotion gets involved. Your anger gets involved. You feel insulted. And so, so if someone harms you, you want to get them back plus some. But we know this to be true because we've seen it in interpersonal conflict. You're having a, you know, you're cooking dinner, you're cooking breakfast with your spouse. And what started as a bit of a recommendation about how to cook the omelet turns into an all out fight about your family of origin. Why? It's because things tend to escalate quickly. And that's why God, in his wisdom, implemented the law of retaliation. It wasn't brutal. It, it, was, it was curbing this spiral of violence that can happen when people get into conflict with each other. Who knows? What God was saying is, Dustin, if someone knocks out your tooth, you can't knock out five of their teeth, even though you think they deserve it. You can't. It's got to be, you've you got to minimize the, the, the punishment has got to fit the, the crime. So, so what God is saying to his people right back in the Old Testament is we are not going to have a culture of ongoing conflict. We are not going to have relationships spiraling into ever-increasing cycles of hostility. Why? Because God didn't create you and I to spend our short few days on earth quarreling with one another, getting payback and adding to the conflict. Who knows that's not the Jesus way. And so we've, we've got to see this in the light of what Jesus is teaching. You go back to the start of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 verse 9, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And so for followers of Jesus, I'm aware there'll be people in church today, you wouldn't consider yourself a follower of Jesus, well, just consider. But for followers of Jesus, the basic disposition, the default disposition for us is one of peace toward others, not one of conflict. The basic mode for followers of Jesus is de-escalation, not escalation. And Jesus is saying, that's what it looks like to be sons of God. To be sons of God, to be children of God, to bear the family resemblance. 
We need to be people who aren't entertaining or indulging in spirals of conflict, but we're bringing peace into situations. And so that's why Jesus says in verse 39, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. It literally means this, do not resist in kind the one who is evil. So if someone responds to you with violence, don't resist in kind. If someone responds to you with greed, don't uh, don't respond with greed. If someone responds to, if someone meets you with insult, don't respond in kind with insult. Jesus is inviting us to be people of a different spirit. Jesus is inviting us to be people who show a better way. And so then Jesus having done that, is everyone still with me? Having done that, Jesus then gives us three examples. So these are not three disconnected parables. These are three examples that reinforce or illustrate in real life what Jesus is saying. So here's the first example. Jesus says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. I don't often use illustrations, but this one is just perfect. Tim Peters, would you come and join me up on stage? Because I think Tim's got some anger that he's been wanting to get out for a while. Anyway, so, so just... Don't look too excited, Tim, all right? Remember, the East London congregation are watching. They still expect you to be pastoral. And so so this only makes sense. I'm nervous. This only makes sense if we understand a little bit about Roman first century class systems. And I'm indebted to my good friend Shane Willard for teaching me this stuff. In, in, In the Roman first century culture, there were nine levels of classes in society. And so if you were on level one, you were the most valuable. You were an important person. But if you were on level nine, you were the least valuable. If you and I were on the same level, then we would be considered equals. But, but if I'm on level one and you're on level five, then you're my lesser. Does everyone, everyone understands that? And so when it came to conflict with people, the class system made a big part in how you would fight with someone. And so there was, there was rules of engagement. So, so if Tim and I are equals and we're having a conflict, Tim would slap me with his right hand, which means his... No, go for it. Which means if if Tim's slapping me with his right hand, he's slapping me on the left cheek. Just... (laughs) He loved it, didn't he? He loved it. In fact, turn to... No, don't turn to... So, so, So if he's slapping me with the right hand, he's slapping me on the left cheek. But Jesus was specific. Jesus said, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek. So so Jesus is speaking about a particular type of conflict. Now, again, just stay there. You'll do more slapping in a moment. Jesus is speaking to Jews, and at that time, Israel was Roman-occupied territory. Now, if a Jewish man didn't comply with a Roman soldier's request, he would get slapped. But, But the Roman did not consider the Jewish subject to be his equal. And so a Jewish man would get slapped by a Roman soldier, but he wouldn't get slapped on the left cheek. He would get slapped on the right cheek. Just slow down. Because if I deem that you are below me in the class system, then, then I would never slap you on the left cheek. Because if I was to slap you with my right hand on your left cheek, I would be deeming that you and I are equals. But if Tim is the, 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 the Roman soldier and I'm his lesser, Tim would slap me on the right cheek. And so go for it, Tim. I feel like that escalated, guys. That was a little bit firmer. Tim, you, you try and get it to get the sound. Thanks a lot. So, so if Tim is slapping me on my right cheek, Tim is using his... Left hand. Okay, remember during COVID, there was no toilet paper? <laughs> well, they lived like that. Your left hand in that culture was, was the unclean hand. You didn't shake with your left hand because that was your poo-poo hand. <laughs> and so, who knows, to get slapped with, your, with someone's right hand on your left cheek, well, well, that's an insult, but at least we're equals. But to get slapped on the right cheek with a left hand, who knows, that's more than just a slap, that's an insult. 
Why? By slapping you on the right cheek with my left hand, I'm not just inflicting pain, I'm making a statement of value about the other person. By slapping them on the right cheek, I'm saying you are inferior to me. In fact, I'm going to slap you on the right cheek with my unclean hand to remind you that you are less than me. That's how they treated a slave. That's how they treated a lesser. It was the cultural equivalent to spitting on someone. And so if I've just been struck on the right cheek by Tim's left hand, by his unclean hand, what are my options? Option one is I can strike back. But if I strike back, that's not going to go well. But I can shrink back. But who knows, to shrink back is to deny my dignity as someone made in the image of God. To shrink back is to be a doormat and allow him to walk all over me. And so Jesus says, you don't need to strike back, nor do you need to shrink back, but rather, if he slaps you on the left cheek, just turn the other cheek to him. Who knows, the moment I turn my left cheek to Tim, I just created a crisis for Tim. Why? Because Tim can't strike me with his left hand because I've turned the cheek away from him. Tim's only option now is to strike me with the right palm on my left cheek. But by doing that, Tim has to acknowledge me as his equal. And so by turning my left cheek, I'm saying to Tim, you have no power to shame or degrade me because my dignity is not based on your approval. So back down or treat me as an equal. Can you see how... This has got nothing to do with saying, well, you should just accept violence and and be someone's doormat. It's got nothing to do with that. It's got everything to do with the dignity that God bestows on every individual. It's actually genius. By turning the other cheek, I just flipped the whole interaction on its head. I just exposed the shallowness of the power play. I de-escalated the violence. I became a peacemaker and I invited my aggressor to meet me at a more dignified level. Give our Roman aggressor a big round of applause. Thank you, Tim. Can you see how Jesus is not talking about exact specifics or commands? Jesus is giving us a wisdom principle. Be creative in finding ways to de-escalate a situation so that you can bring peace. Let's look at the second example, Matthew 5.40. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. So again, you've got to understand their culture. If you owed someone money, but you couldn't pay it all now, they could take your tunic uh, as an earnest or as a deposit. And so Jesus' first audiences were were economically destitute. They were struggling to survive. They were taxed to the eyeballs by Rome. And so you've got to imagine the interaction. You've got someone who's already quite poor and then someone who is rich and has already got more than enough, who has already taken your land, who is already taxing you to the eyeballs, has now come to sue you and take your tunic. Who knows? This is an interaction of shameless greed and everyone knows it. And so, so Jesus says, look, imagine the situation. Someone comes to you and they've already got more than enough and they're already being corrupt. And now out of greed, they're trying to take your tunic as well. Jesus says, listen, let it go like this. Hey, you're demanding my tunic. You know what? Here, you can have my tunic. And not only that, why don't you have my cloak as well? There you go. It's yours. Take my cloak as well. In fact, it looks good on you. That color is perfect on you. Here, here have, have my cloak as well. It looks fantastic. Why would you respond like that? Because who knows, when you meet greed with generosity, what you actually do is you expose to everyone the greed that is at play in the aggressor's heart. To take my tunic and my cloak, who's going to actually do that? To do that, you're going to leave me pretty much naked and no one is going to do that. And so again, the way to end the conflict is not going tit for tat with someone and both trying to extract as much as you can from each other, rather act out of a different spirit. Counter their greed with extravagant generosity, you will flip the situation on its head and you will force the person to look within their heart to analyze their motivations. Is this making sense? It's about being a peacemaker. Here's the third one, verse 41. It says, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Now, in that day, Roman soldiers would carry 30 kilo packs around with them on their back. Remember we said there was nine classes in society. Well, Jews were class eight people, second from the bottom. And Roman military law said that if you had to walk a distance, you could actually force the lower classes to carry your pack 
for you. In other words, just get the underlings to do it for you. But there were rules around it. You see, the Roman government couldn't have the Jews spending their whole day carrying packs. Otherwise, they wouldn't be working. And if they weren't working, they weren't accruing tax and they would lose out financially. And so Roman military law stated that a soldier could force a Jew to carry his pack one mile But if he forced a Jew to carry it more than one mile, it was actually a court-martialed offence. Why? Because by going two miles, he's not working, and by not working, he's not accruing tax, and the Roman government is losing money. So check this out. Jesus says, if someone forces you to go one mile, when you get to the one-mile mark, keep going. Keep walking. Why? The Roman soldier is going to be desperate for you to stop. Come back, come back. Because if word gets out that the the, the man went two miles, then that soldier is going to get court-martialed and he may get his pay docked. And so the moment you get to the end of the first mile, start running and watch them chase after you. In other words, the point is this. It's, It's a way to remind someone, hey, I'm your equal. And even if you treat me like a slave, I'm going to respond to you like I'd treat a friend or a family member. Can you see? It's a wisdom principle. It's a genius, non-violent way of peacemaking while at the same time affirming your own dignity. And so, so what's the big idea Jesus is trying to teach us through these three illustrations? He is saying, when a person wrongs you, because people will wrong you in life, when a person degrades you, when a person insults you, responding to conflict with more conflict is only going to create strife. But I've not called you to create strife. I've called you to be a peacemaker. Well, how do I be a peacemaker? Well, instead of responding to people in kind, I'll do to them what they did to me. No, no, no. Instead of doing that, meet their indignity by treating them with dignity. Meet their greed by treating them with generosity. Meet their unfair demands with a willingness to do more than is asked because as followers of Jesus, our basic disposition, it is not strife, our basic disposition with other people is peace because peace is exactly what Jesus has achieved for us with God through the cross. So how do we do that? Some of you are thinking, nice theory, Dustin, but that doesn't work in real life. Like, really? Like, how could I have the resources within me to, to suppress the desire to retaliate and instead operate as a peacemaker? Let me close. There's, there's three realities that Christians have that give us the power to become peacemakers. Number one is this. God gives us dignity far higher than another person's opinion of us. By that I mean, we know, because we've read the Bible, that every human being possesses God's image. That means you possess God's image, I possess God's image, and the aggressor, my opponent, my enemy, they possess God's image as well. And so when I'm insulted or or treated with indignity, I, I might feel like I need to shrink back or strike back, but faith in Jesus means I don't need to do either of those things. I don't need to shrink back. In fact, I can turn to them my left cheek. I don't need to step down from anyone because I'm their equal. But but nor do I want to strike back and dehumanize my opponent because I've decided this opponent, this person who's treating me like dirt, even though I hate what they do, I can acknowledge that they are made in God's image as well. So I'm not going to treat this person as I think they deserve. I'm going to treat that person as they are worth. They are made in God's image, so I'll respond with dignity. You know, one of the best embodiments of this truth in modern history is Martin Luther King Jr., who who resisted the evil of racism without resorting to violence. And and, and many moderns have forgotten that it wasn't because of, you know, his commitment to quote-unquote social justice, whatever that is, and, and it wasn't because of a personality type or temperament, it was because of his Christian beliefs. In fact, Martin Luther King Jr., in a sermon preached in 1965, said this, it'll be on screen, he said, the whole concept of Imago Dei, the image of God is the idea that all men have something within them that God injected. Not that they have substantial unity with God, but that every man has a capacity to have fellowship with God, and this gives him uniqueness. It gives him worth. It gives him dignity. And we must never forget that as a nation. There are no gradations in the image of God. Every man from a treble white to a base black is significant on God's keyboard. Precisely because every man and woman is made in the image of God, we must believe this and we must live by it. Who knows, that gives me the resource within to to actually curb my desire to retaliate and to extend peace and dignity to others. Secondly, God gives us grace far greater than another person's offense toward me. 
The reality is people offend us. People snub us. But, but think about this. We snubbed God. Just got real quiet in church. We offended God. How did God respond to us when we snubbed him? Well, the Bible tells us in Romans 5.8 that God showed his love for us in that while we were still offending and offensive toward him, Christ died for us. And so the message of the cross, Calvary Church, is this. The most loving person is the one who acts first to end the hostility. Ever been in a conflict with someone where you're just not talking? Some of you are like, that's my home right now. Just look straight ahead. Just look straight ahead. We're going to make it through. Stay with me. Just stay with me. I'm going to get you to the car park safely. It's fine. There's hostility and no one is willing to break the stalemate. We'll we'll think about what did Jesus do for us when there was a stalemate between us and God? The most loving, mature person was the one who took the first step to end the hostility and to bring reconciliation. And so, so can you see that while we were still hostile with God, God acted lovingly to bring peace to us. So the point is this, the cross of Jesus Christ is not just about the forgiveness of sin. The cross of Jesus Christ is about ending the hostility cycle. Listen, maybe you're in church today and you are in the crazy cycle. You've got a relationship maybe with a colleague, an employer, a former friend, a former spouse, and it is crazy. Listen, someone has to act first and you need to decide, do I want to be right or do I want to have peace? Because you can spend your next 10 years claiming your rights to be right and yet lose your peace. What's worth more? Take the first step forgive, end the hostility. Listen, the way Jesus has treated us ought make some kind of difference in the way we treat one another. Ephesians 4 32 says this, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Why? As God in Christ forgave you. Jesus ended the hostility between us and God. And so if you know anything of the grace of God, you and I should be people who become the bigger people and say, you know what, let's just end the hostility. If I have to absorb the pain, I'll absorb the pain. Isn't that exactly what Christ did on the cross? He absorbed the pain so that the hostility could end and we could have peace with God. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to be. Can you say amen to today, church? Here's a third and final point is this. God promises, and you need to catch this, God promises justice far better than our anger can achieve. I've never seen anger produce anything life-giving, but we all get angry. So what do we do with our anger? Well, when someone wrongs us, our internal dialogue, our internal narrative, our internal justification becomes this. It's not right. So I'm going to set it right. And so we feel entitled to pay them back to give them their just desserts because we want to set things right. You you call it anger. I call it setting things right. Well, who knows when our head gets into that space, we've lost sight of one of the most basic Christian truths. When I get angry and, and I want to give someone what they deserve, I need to remind myself that vengeance doesn't belong to Dustin. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Churches don't talk much about God being a judge anymore, and perhaps that's why there's spirals of anger and dysfunction in relationships. You see, vengeance belongs to God. I'm not the judge of the living and the dead. You're not the judge of the living and the dead. God is the judge of the living and the dead. Look at Romans chapter 12. It says this. We'll close in a moment. It says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought, be creative, give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Can you see what Paul's doing? He's reaching back to the Sermon on the Mount. Live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it. That's a word for some of us today. Leave it. Walk away from it. Leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry. So here's the thing. If I can resolve in my spirit, yes, it felt unjust. Yes, it was not fair, but I'm going to leave it to God. God ultimately is going to judge this situation. That changed my, my part in the interaction. What can I do now? Now, if my enemy is hungry, I can feed him. If he's thirsty, I can give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Oh, I still like that bit. Do not, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
So, so how can I walk away from conflict? How can I be a peacemaker? How can, I, how can I put up with the idea that I've been ripped off in that situation? I'll tell you how I can do it. I can do it because I believe that God is just. And ultimately, God will do the work of restoration and God will do the work of retribution. God will let justice happen and he won't let evil go unpunished. Now, that might mean in this life, from time to time, a follower of Jesus might be wronged but I can live with it. In fact, I can live with it and I don't need to harbour bitterness and revenge. My heart doesn't need to hold on to a sense of injustice. I can literally hand it over to God knowing God will work it out. Can you see how this is actually about the health of our hearts? Some of us have been holding on to things for years and years and years and you feel justified in holding on to it. Listen, you're not the judge. God is the judge. And at the end of time, God's going to work it out. And if you, if you believe that deep down in your heart, that will have real implications for how you respond to those people who have wronged you. First Peter 2.23, because when the preacher says, I'll close with this, he means he's got another verse. <laughs> got to finish with this. You know, you're not the only innocent person to suffer. Jesus was entirely innocent and yet was grievously wronged. First Peter 2, 23, it says, when he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed for, for you are straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Think about this. The most innocent man who ever lived, Jesus, was dealt the greatest injustice that's ever been dealt, the cross. But at the cross, Jesus held his peace. Why? It wasn't personality type. It was a conviction. My father, he will judge justly. And if that's true, I don't need to live fueled by revenge and bitterness and vengeance. I can put it in God's hands, knowing that ultimately, God will deal with it in a far better way than my anger ever could. Blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called sons of God. How many people are grateful for Jesus today? That while we were in hostility with God, when we had, when we had snubbed our nose to God and said, I'd rather live without you and I know better and I'm going to do it my way, all of that time God was patient. God was long-suffering. He took the first step. He'd sent his son to die upon the cross. Why? To achieve peace so that we could be reconciled to God. Having received that act of peace, how much more should you and I go and extend peace to the people around about us as sons and daughters of God? Can you say amen today, church? Come on, in all of our locations, why don't we stand to our feet in East London and Cairns and Emerald and, gee, if you're online, you can stand as well if you want. In a moment, I want us to lift our hands and pray. And, and I'm not going to call people forward and ask people to respond. But of course, in a crowd of this size across all of our campuses, there'd be many people today and, and your, your imagination defaults back to getting even with people. You're having imaginary conversations in the shower. You, you, you're wishing ill upon people. You, you're, you're rehearsing conversations where you always win because you're going to get them. Listen, if, if that's where you're starting to default to, Jesus loves you. He really does. But, but he needs to come and just pull that bitterness out of our hearts so that we can honor Jesus and live healthy lives. So come on, why don't we lift our hands? Some of us today really need to say, Jesus, come and, come and touch my heart today. Jesus, take it out of my hands and I'm going to put it into your hands. Come on, let's lift hands high to heaven. Even symbolically saying, Jesus, I let go of resentment. I let go of vengeance at that ex-lover, that ex-business partner, that ex-student, that, that family member. Jesus, I'm going to leave it to you. I'm going to allow you to be the judge and I'm going to get on and just be a blessing. Father, today, we thank you for your goodness toward us. Lord, help us as people in Calvary Church. More than that, help us as followers of Jesus to be peacemakers in our world. Father, for people today who have been wronged, Lord, people who have been injured because of the sin or the greed or the hard-heartedness of others. Lord, I just pray that the Holy Spirit would come today and minister grace and peace into our hearts. Help us to extend to others what you've given to us 
And God, deep down in our hearts, we trust that at the end of the day, you'll work it all out. And God, we trust in that. We rest in that. In Jesus' name, everyone in every campus said, amen. Come on, one more time. Can we just honor the Lord Jesus together for his grace?